Okay, I think it's 12 o'clock and therefore time to start. Turnout is pretty bad. Um, my name is Richard Toll. I'm <coughs> one of the professors of economics. Um, you won't see much of me until your third year. Um, I mostly teach uh, environmental economics and climate economics. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the blackouts uh, that may well hit us um, in a few weeks. Um, I'm going to talk about the blackouts themselves, uh, the immediate causes of these, um, uh, but I'm going to spend most of my time actually talking um, about the underlying causes uh, of why we have a capacity crunch uh, in our power supply in this country. Um, I gave you my name. One of the things that I noticed is not just that there's a low turnout, but you guys are also not very keen on giving your opinion about people. Um, we recently in the UK uh, adopted the American uh, Rate Your Professor uh, website, which so are actually very good uh, feedback uh, tools. So if you're keen um, on that, uh, you can do that. Uh, here, and you can do that for uh, every other lecturer uh, at this university, right? <clears throat> uh, those of you who have been paying attention to the news uh, a few weeks ago have probably seen this picture. Uh, this is the Ditcot uh, power station catching fire, uh, which is not good. Uh, a bit earlier, a uh, very similar thing happened uh, in uh, Iron Bridge power station. Um, and a bit before that, we had a fire in Ferry Bridge uh, power station. Um, at the same time, um, there are cracks in the nuclear power plants in Haysham, uh, as well as in Hartlepool, all of which should actually make you nervous. Um, this is what uh, the office for gas and electricity markets, that's essentially the regulator, uh, thinks the supply margin uh, in electricity uh, is. Uh, in red, you're sort of looking at their best guesses. Uh, in gray, you're looking at a sensitivity analysis. Um, <clears throat> and what you see is that they think that, or they used to think, that's before those accidents uh, that I showed you, uh, that this coming winter, 2014, 2015, supply only exceeds demand by uh, some 6.5%. That's their best guess, uh, but it may be somewhere between 3 uh, and 12%. Now, as I said, that is before <coughs> uh, the uh, five accidents uh, that I've showed you. Uh, the national grid... That's the entity that operates uh, the power network. Um, showed an updated uh, analysis only a few weeks ago, where the gray bar to your right uh, is what Ofgem uh, thought uh, before the summer. Uh, and then the red blocks are things that, were, that are subtracted uh, from this. Uh, so we start with the 6%. Uh, margin, but then Iron Bridge caught fire, then Ferry Bridge caught fire, then they wrote the report, and then Ditcot uh, caught fire, so Ditcot isn't here. Um, then they discovered these cracks uh, in Hartlepool and Haysham. ADF, the operator of uh, Hartlepool and Haysham, keeps saying that next week the cracks will be fixed. And they've been saying that for about six weeks now that next week it will be fixed, and just this morning they released another press release. No, it will really be next week. Not this week as we promised before, or last week as we promised before, or the week before that as we promised before. No, it will be next week. Um, but yeah, we have to wait and see what they really mean uh, by next week. Um, <coughs> and all of these things sort of detract from uh, the supply margin. Uh, in between, and I'll come back to that, we have that uh, a statement by the owners of the Barking power station saying we're not going to run this winter. We don't think there's enough money. Um, 
And fortunately, uh, the Agbro plant that broke down last year has been repaired and is now uh, uh, on stream again. Uh, so if you compare uh, the before the summer uh, assessment of the supply margin uh, of, by Ofgem, where it was 6% in the current uh, view by the national grid, it has come down from 6% uh, to 4%, all in a matter uh, of uh, months. I'll come back to what this all means and why, where this comes from. Uh, this is from the same uh, report uh, by uh, the National Grid. <clears throat> and what you're looking at here is the total power supply if everything runs at its max. Peak demand this winter will probably be around uh, 55 gigawatts. And what you see is that everything runs uh, at its full capacity. Uh, then actually we have 75 uh, gig available in power. Um, so you may wonder what is the problem. Right? Uh, the issue is that these power stations rarely run at full capacity. Uh, so if you start derating them and you say sort of what is a likely output rather than what is the sort of the uh, nameplate output uh, of these power plants, uh, you get this picture. Um, and <coughs> so the, the blue bar to your right is what is likely to be the demand for electricity at its peak, it's around 55, and at the same time we're looking at the left-hand bar, what is the electricity that we have available. And you see that there is very little in between. It's, uh, at the moment they expect that there's only 4.1% uh, in between, or about uh, 2 uh, gig. Which means that if another power, uh, power plant catches fire and another one, then we're down to zero, right? There's another uh, thing going on here, and that is um, that they assume that there is wind available during peak hours. So on a quiet night, when there is no wind, You can subtract uh, this amount, and that is right about the margin. So one more accident and a quiet night without wind means there won't be enough electricity, right? Uh, peak demand typically occurs in the week just before Christmas. <clears throat> it's cold. It is dark, a lot of people working overtime, lots of other people having parties, right? There's Christmas lights everywhere. So that is sort of when our demand for electricity peaks. Typically the week before Christmas, somewhere between 5 and 7 in the afternoon. There's also peaks in January for the same reason, obviously. Uh, Christmas is gone by then, but it's still pretty cold, it's still pretty dark. Uh, so uh, there will be... Uh, peaks in electricity demand as well, sort of going towards the 55. Chances are that on one of those nights there won't be any wind, right? And actually, the climate of uh, England is such that during winter time, cold and a lack of wind coincide. Uh, and darkness is driven by sun, right, so uh, the darkness will come anyway, uh, so chances are uh, that at one of those very cold nights when the demand for electricity is pretty high, there simply won't be enough electricity to go around. <clears throat> um, and this is a real possibility. People won't say this in the press in order to avoid panic, in order to uh, avoid uh, damage to the reputation uh, of the UK as a place that is open for business. Uh, but it's a good place to invest and uh, do all sorts of high-tech stuff that requires a lot of electricity. Uh, so the government is a bit cagey uh, about this, but in secret they are actually very seriously preparing for uh, what might come. Um, <clears throat> the fear is a blackout. If all of a sudden there is not enough electricity, 
there is demand for electricity, but there is no supply for electricity, then you get all sorts of weird physical effects going on on, on the net, and you may have power surges that burn uh, cables and that sort of stuff, and then things get out of control, and you may have blackouts, a small drop in supply below uh, the demand may cause actually entire power, uh, entire parts of the, the, the grid to trip out. Um, so that is what they hope to avoid. Uh, but at the moment, the best way of avoiding an uncontrolled blackout is to go for controlled blackouts or brownouts, as they're called in the jargon, which simply means we're going to switch off part of the grid. We're going to say, sorry, Brighton, you don't have any electricity for the next hour in order to preserve the integrity of the grid uh, in the rest of the country. That may well happen, and that they will go for rolling blackouts, uh, rolling brownouts that first we're going to switch off Brighton for an hour, and then we're going to switch off Southampton for an hour. Right? Uh, that may well uh, happen. Um, <clears throat> This is all very unfortunate, right? I put a, a link to a video um, of Dieter Helm speaking in the House of Commons uh, about this. It is very unfortunate that a country like the UK cannot keep the price of its energy low, cannot reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, and cannot uh, guarantee uh, the supply of electricity all at the same time. Most developed countries are actually very well capable of this, and the UK stands out uh, for its incompetence in this regard, and it's more like uh, the situation you would see in countries uh, such as uh, Lebanon, for instance. Um, so how did we get here? And that is uh, an interesting uh, economic uh, question. Um, <clears throat> In order to understand this, you need to understand a little bit about electricity and about the market for electricity. Um, and <clears throat> electricity is unlike any other economic good in the sense that it cannot be stored. So for electricity, demand has to meet supply. Now it's a standard microeconomic assumption, right, that demand meets su supply, but typically when we look at that, we don't really mean that. And for instance, if you take the case of peanut butter, demand meets supply roughly. Because we store some peanut butter in our fridges. And we store some peanut butter on the shelves of supermarkets. And we store some peanut butter in the warehouses. So it is not the case that the demand for peanut butter matches the supply for peanut butter because there's inventories in between, right? But that is not the case for electricity. For electricity, demand has to, or supply has to meet demand every second. Which is a completely different proposition than saying, well, if it's sort of correct, on an annual average, and then it's fine. That is not how electricity works. Uh, <clears throat> electricity is supplied by uh, big machines that tend to break down, that are uh, very temperamental, uh, and that means that if you want your supply to meet your demand at every minute, then you always have to have some electricity uh, in reserve, uh, the so-called spinning reserve. There's always a few power plants they are just generating electricity, but not supplying electricity. And if, if then another plant trips, you can put additional electricity on the net. Uh, <clears throat> the reason for that is not just in order for the supply to meet the demand at every point. It would actually be pretty awkward if now uh, the lights would go out, uh, right? Uh, it's not just that. It's also, as I said before, that if you have an unexpected drop in electricity supply, then your wires may fry, right? You'll have a surge uh, in the energy on the net and things may just start burning uh, or breaking and then you're in much deeper uh, trouble. <clears throat> um, this is a sort of this 
guaranteed supply is a system property. This is what we want for the grid as a whole. And that means that it's a public good. The individual suppliers of electricity or the individual clients of electricity, the in, in individual customers, don't really care about these sort of system properties. It is only the national regulator uh, that cares about this. And the way this is solved um, <coughs> is that uh, the national grid holds auctions and say, who wants to supply reserve power? And you have to do this, right? Because those power stations that are running in reserve are not selling electricity. So they're not generating any revenue. But they are running, so they are incurring costs, right? So somehow we need to compensate them. And the way we do that is to put a levy on all electricity bought and sold and use that levy to buy reserve power, right? <clears throat> um, we typically think of uh, electricity as electrons, right? Traveling uh, in the opposite direction than what you think. Uh, but they are electrons, right? So we can think of these things as waves as well. Uh, and if we think of one power station sending waves of electricity this direction and another power station sending waves of electricity in uh, the other direction, if that frequency of that way, those waves are not regulated, then they may cancel each other out, right? This is not what we want. Uh, so there's another uh, public policy issue here, and that is that we need to coordinate the frequencies. And the way this is typically done is that the big turbines, right, are sort of turning. The way this is typically done is that the regulator simply says, thou shalt turn at a specified plug speed, right? So all power stations in the UK, all gas turbines, all coal turbines, and preferably also all wind turbines, are turning at the exact same speed. It is simply uh, a coordination problem that is, is solved uh, by coercive regulation. <clears throat> and then we also have the problem uh, that the grid itself is a natural monopoly very expensive to put it in place. We would not want to have two electricity grids next to each other competing with, with each other. So this is a truly a natural uh, monopoly in the sense that the benefits of competition are smaller than the additional cost of duplicating the supply, right? That's the definition of a natural monopoly. And the electricity grid, as well as uh, the road uh, grid, are natural uh, examples, uh, standard examples of a natural monopoly. So all of that means that the power markets should be heavily regulated, and fortunately also is. <clears throat> um, that by way of introduction. The way the electricity market itself works is typically visualized by uh, so-called merit curves, and that is what you're seeing here. Um, Sort of the line that is going up are all the different sources of electricity ranked by the cheapest source in the variable cost. So the cheapest source uh, uh, at any given time, but uh, excluding the capital cost. And you rank them and you say, oh, this is the demand uh, for electricity at any point in time, and we're going to first try and supply it with the cheapest sources, then we're going to add the next cheapest and so on and so forth until supply meets uh, demand. <coughs> and then where the two lines cross, uh, that is what the price will be. That has a number of implications. Uh, the first is that if you're at the bottom of the curve, you actually get a very good price for e electricity. You can supply it at almost zero cost, but you get whatever the price is. So there, the producer margins and the producer surplus are pretty high. If you look at where demand meets supply, the marginal plant supplies at cost, at the variable cost. 
even. So that means that in the short run they make a zero margin. If you start adding in capital costs, they turn a loss, right? So you don't want to be at the steep end of this curve, you want to be at the bottom end of this curve. Um, <clears throat> and that is important to understand, right? And these are all different companies uh, supplying uh, electricity at different uh, points in time. So base load plants, the ones that are ru always running and supply electricity very cheaply, earn lots of money. Mid-merit plants, the ones that come on and off and on and off, uh, make less money. And the ones that only supply the peak make no money at all or very, very little. But this peak supply is very important to keep the lights on in the week before Christmas, right? Um, so there's various ways of going about this. <clears throat> in solving this, this conundrum, right? You want those speakers, you want the peak supply. So how are you gonna pay for companies to supply this? Um, in, in California, they thought let's just go for the free market and let's just let the, the market solve this and we're just going to let the price go up and up and up and up and up and up. That ended in tears. Um, I mean, you, you guys typically pay uh, something like 14 pence a kilowatt hour um, for your electricity. The wholesale market in uh, California during peak times, it's fall and summer because of uh, air conditioning, went up to a pound, 10 pounds, 100 pounds per kilowatt hour. Very, very expensive. Um, and <laughs> uh, the suppliers didn't like it because it became very unpredictable. Cl customers really didn't like it that during some days, particularly during the hottest days when you really need your air conditioning, all of a sudden you were paying 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 1,000 times as much uh, for your electricity. So that experiment was very rapidly shut down. Um, in uh, England and Wales, we rely on bilateral contracts. <coughs> that is, we have contracts between all the suppliers and the demanders um, <clears throat> sort of for long-term supply, these sort of things are sort of fixed for a couple of years or sometimes even a couple of decades. Um, and the assumption there is that these long-term contracts would create a property right. Because um, <clears throat> essentially if the power companies cannot supply the electricity demanded, they will lose reputation, right? And they will lose goodwill. But if they're only there for this particular week, then they don't really care about this, and it sort of becomes a commons uh, problem, that if you have a, a, a commons that is sort of jointly owned by uh, by a, a village around it and everybody puts their sheep on, their on the commons, then you start overgrazing. But the benefits of putting an additional sheep uh, on the commons sort of falls on you, whereas the cost of overgrazing are sort of shared by everybody. So it is in everybody's personal interest to put more sheep uh, on the commons than is really uh, justified or uh, that, that the commons can actually support. This thought here is very similar, that if you have all these electricity suppliers, nobody really cares about the reduction in the reputation and, and, and the inability uh, to meet uh, the supply, and therefore nobody would, none of the companies supplying electricity would really be bothered. And the thought here is the same as in the comments, uh, that if you create stable property rights, that if you sort of start splitting up the commons in fields that are owned by individual, individual farmers, then the cost of overgrazing fall on yourself because you're no longer overgrazing other people's grazing lands, but you're overgrazing your own. 
and therefore you hurt yourself and you would not do that. The thought in the electricity market by Steve Littleshell, the first uh, regulator uh, of, of GEM was the same. By creating long-term bilateral contracts, we create a property right of the power companies over the well-being of their customers. They would not walk away if we don't really supply them. Uh, and this would create an incentive to also care for what is happening during peak times. <clears throat> Theoretically, it's a very beautiful uh, uh, piece of work. As I've argued in the beginning, in practice it did not quite work uh, as well. And I'll come back to some of the uh, other reasons too. Uh, so also the experiments in England and Wales seems to fail and the government is actually uh, uh, belatedly uh, abandoning uh, this experiment. Elsewhere, they solve this problem of supplying the peak as follows. A bit the same as, or actually almost the same as for reserve payments, right? You sort of say that supplying the peak is a system property, we want, it's a public good, we want the whole electricity market to do this. So what do we do? We put a levy on all electricity uh, uh, bought and we use the money collected through this levy to reward those companies that supply peak power. And that is actually just a block round that they're given. That's just a subsidy. Because of course, I mean, if you run your power plant only in the week before Christmas, between five and seven, you don't sell a lot of electricity, so your revenue from the market is pretty low. You still need to maintain your plant for the rest of the year, so you need basically a subsidy uh, to get this uh, done. So that is how it's solved in most electricity markets, and England and Wales are now moving towards this, but we're not quite there yet. The whole problem of peak supply is exacerbated by um, environmental policy, and I'm going to mention two. Uh, one is uh, our obsession uh, with climate change, which means that we very heavily subsidize um, wind power to come on stream. Wind does not come for free, right, or wind power does not come for free. The wind itself does come for free, so you have a zero cost fuel. So wind is always at the bottom of the merit curve. Of course, you need to pay for the capital that is in your uh, turbine and for all the cables and uh, the concrete that sits at the bottom. So wind does not come for free. Wind power does not come for free, but the wind does. And the marginal cost of running a wind turbine is zero. Almost zero, right? practically zero. Uh, so wind supplies electricity at zero marginal cost. <clears throat> so they're always at the bottom uh, of the, um, the merit order curve. And that means that they're pushing others further up. So they're pushing other plants towards the mid-merit peak territory where they're making less money. Right? And this is simple pecuniary, pecuniary uh, externality. There's nothing wrong with this in principle. It just makes other power plants less profitable. And therefore reduces the incentives of companies to uh, invest in those things. At the same time, wind is variable and unpredictable. So you can never fully rely on a wind-driven electricity system. You simply, I mean, you would have electricity when the wind blows and no electricity when there's no wind, right? So you can never have a 100% wind-based uh, power system. Engineers actually disagree on how high it can go. Um, some say 20%, some say 30%. Um, But at the same time, if you push in wind, you push out the others, and you reduce their incentive uh, to uh, invest. <clears throat> and that is one of the reasons why 
we are running out of uh, supply. And the other reason is something that happened before you guys were born. You may ask your mums and dads about acid rain uh, and the scares about all the forests dying and all the fish dying in the, in the 70s and the 80s. Um, and, and some of your parents may recall those times. Um, acid rain is essentially solved in Europe. It's a big problem in China and India uh, and increasingly so in Africa. But in Europe, uh, it is essentially a solved problem. But the wheels of bureaucracy turn very slowly. Uh, capital is very long-lived in uh, power generation. A typical power plant has a lifetime of 40, 50, 60 uh, years. Uh, and that means that events from before you were born can actually affect you. And one of the things that we did way back when to combat uh, acid rain is to agree on the Large Plants Combustion Directive, something you've probably never heard of, which essentially says power plants cannot do certain things. You cannot emit uh, too much sulfur, too much nitrogen. Um, and if they do, they have two choices. Either you put on a scrubber or you close it down. If you're talking about an old power plant, refurbishing a power plant to sort of put on those scrubbers is actually pretty costly. And if the plant is old already, you're never going to earn your money back. Uh, so what people have done, uh, particularly in the UK, is simply close down uh, those power plants. <coughs> and that is uh, what is going on here, right? That is why barking uh, was closed. The owner simply said, it doesn't pay for me to run. Right? Because I would need to do this and this and this. Need to meet all these environmental regulations, particularly with regard to sulfur. Not going to do that. I'm simply going to close down. Right? Um, and that is what we've uh, seen uh, happening. So events from before you were born uh, may lead to a very dark uh, Christmas for you. <coughs> right. uh, the upshot of all this is that there's been preciously little investment in new power generating capacity in the UK or in England and Wales. Um, what power generators have done is they've been sweating their assets. They have these power plants, they're just running them, they're letting them run down, they're not investing a lot of money in maintenance. Um, they're simply getting as much money out uh, as they can and then they plan to go to Germany or to Spain or to uh, Vietnam or Korea where the market is more lucrative for them. That has been their game plan and has been their game plan for a couple of decades now. Right? Get as much money out of, the, out of Britain as you can and then move elsewhere. Um, the regulator, and I'll come back uh, in the end to the role of the regulator in all this, <laughs> has not really copped on. Uh, they've been focusing on a couple of things. In order to keep the lights on, the last couple of years they've focused very heavily on demand management or interruptible supply contracts, where essentially they're paying companies to take less electricity. So if you're Tesco's, for instance, <coughs> you have lots of shops with lots of uh, cooling, right? Lots of fridges. So Ofgem is now paying Tesco's to turn up the temperature in their fridges between 5 and 7 in the evening. That reduces peak electricity demands. Does not really hurt your food, right? Because it takes a while for these things to warm up so that actually your food starts to spoil. So that's what they're doing, and they're doing that going around the country, looking at every major uh, user of electricity and say, well, during peak hours, can't we pay you to not use electricity? Uh, that's been uh, their focus. Uh, and of course, uh, as I said, we're heavily focused uh, on uh, adding wind to the system, unreliable and as expensive as it may be. Um, and uh, you probably picked up 
uh, that some of our uh, dear leaders are also pretty gung-ho about nuclear. Um, previous governments, uh, actually it was Ed Miliband when he was uh, Minister or Secretary of Energy, uh, announced uh, that there would be two, uh, ten new nuclear power plants built uh, between uh, then, well, I think it was 2010, 2011 and 2020. What you're looking at here is the age of the existing fleet of power plants. Um, now what you see is that in most years, worldwide, we only build a few of these things. So for the UK to announce we're going to build 10 of these beasts in the next 10 years, is a tad optimistic. Um, <clears throat> uh, this graph here shows all the power plants under construction, right? Um, and uh, the UK is actually not on this, but if the UK or if Miliband's plans would be uh, on this, then we would actually be in the top three, right? In terms of power plants uh, under uh, uh, construction. You also see that the countries that are able to build a lot of nuclear power plants in a short time are not necessarily the most democratic uh, countries uh, in the world. Um, there's also uh, some issues with the sheer feasibility of these things. Uh, I show this picture uh, of how many nuclear power plants have been built over the recent uh, decades. Now what you see is that only a few have been built um, in the last couple of years. Uh, so this is the age and this is the number of nuclear power plants that are one year old to two year old and so on and so forth. What you see is that over the last decades actually very few nuclear power plants have been built. <laughs> And the boom in the 70s and the 80s are, is well and truly over. And that means that the capacity to build nuclear power plants has eroded. And at the moment, there's only one company in the world that can make the big vessel that contains the dirty stuff and the dangerous stuff. That is a company in Japan. But it's pretty hard because you sort of like need precision mechaneering at a large scale. So it's only one Japanese company that is still in this market that can actually build nuclear vessels. And that company has a waiting list of 15 years. So if you want a nuclear power plant ready in 2020, you need to get on the waiting list for a vessel in 2005 so that it will, no, 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 no in 2003 so that it will be delivered in 2018 and then you can build all the apparatus around it, right? So if you want a nuclear power plant ready in 2020, you need to have put your order in in 2003 and because of the planning process in the UK it takes very long and people don't really like nuclear and Greenpeace as much smarter lawyers than the government has, you need to start your planning application in 1993, right? to get a nuclear power plant running in 2020. Now obviously we did not do that. So Miliband's plans were completely and utterly unrealistic, right? Um, and we have of course the problem that nuclear and wind uh, don't mix. Wind is variable, nuclear power plants you want to run at a steady state. If you don't, you generate all sorts of physical problems in these things. You really don't want to go there. Um, <clears throat> um, there's more issues with the nuclear. Uh, so when uh, the government changed from Labour to uh, uh, Conservative uh, Lib Dem, um, there was also a change, not in the plans, we, the current government still wants lots of nuclear, uh, but we no longer want to, to subsidize them, or at least that was the uh, initial position of the government. <clears throat> Nobody builds nuclear on subsidized. The risks are too great, the costs are too great. Um, so when the current government announced we're going to build nuclear, 10 nuclear power plants without subsidy, everybody walked away. 
everybody who can build a nuclear power plant said, we're going to build nuclear power plants in China, where we can get subsidies, right, or in uh, Korea, uh, or in uh, India, or wherever, until governments only had one partner left, right? And at that point, the government realized either we give up on our nuclear plants and say and lose face, right? Because we made a very strong announcement that this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to solve the supply crisis next winter, right? Um, or we're going to pay the company whatever it wants, right? And they opted for the latter. And uh, the deal that we now have with ADF, uh, of course, is probably their most profitable contract ever, right? They're going to make, ADF is going to make so much money out of this. Uh, it's unbelievable. <clears throat> um, and the electricity, uh, the price of the electricity uh, is uh, quite incredibly high. Um, and you sort of like see the negotiating tactics uh, there, right? ADF is a state-owned company. Therefore, it can sort of take a long view towards negotiations with other governments. Its competitors are privately owned, so they did not want to keep talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking some more uh, to uh, the UK government. So they all walked away until only uh, ADF uh, was left uh, and essentially had the government over a barrel, right? And to their credit uh, <clears throat> and to the benefit of their uh, owners, right? The French government actually came, walked away with a very good deal for them. Um, I've <clears throat> been talking about investments, I've been talking about regulations, um, I've been talking about politics, and I've not mentioned these two words that are here, regulatory uncertainty. So the power market is heavily regulated. That means that your future profits, your expected profits, depend heavily on the details of future regulation. Capital is long-lived, so we're talking about regulations 20, 30, 40 years into the future. <clears throat> now, if you are confronted with a government that can't make up its mind, with a regulator that can't make up its mind, you wonder, why should I invest here, right? Because if these things change from day to day, from week to week, from month to month, from year to year, you, your, your profits can evaporate. So from an investor's perspective, regulatory uncertainty in this particular market is deadly, right? It's fatal. Uh, and that is exactly what we have, right? In the UK, we have a weak regulator and we have very excitable politicians. And uh, an oil exec uh, from and, and the excitable politicians uh, are shown here at the bottom, right? Um, these are the current energy secretary and his five uh, predecessors. And what you see is that some of them actually just use this as a stepping stone to a bigger job, right? They were not really interested in the energy portfolio in the first place. They just use this as a promotion. Um, and, and an executive of Shell, a very senior guy, uh, actually made the statement that Venezuela is more deep, the government of Venezuela is more dependable than the government of the UK if it comes to uh, energy regulation. And uh, their civil servants are actually much uh, more competent than the ones you would see in the UK, right? Because in the UK, they're just all over the place. Now, if you don't know much about Venezuela, I suggest that you look it up, right? Um, <clears throat> Does all of this mean that the lights go out? I don't know. We stocked up on batteries, we stocked up on firewood, we stocked up on candles because I'm not going to run the risk. I would suggest that you do the same thing. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the only sort of silver lining in all this is that we've actually not shut down those old coal-fired power plants. We just mothballed them. That is, they're not costing any money, but given a few months of effort, they can come back on stream. So perhaps you should not worry so much about next year. For this year, 
They are still mothballs, right? And nobody is reviving their power plants. Um, <clears throat> the politicians have been essentially caught unawares by all this, right? They've, uh, they've not paid any attention to the supply side. They have paid a lot of attention to the demand side uh, on electricity. Because, of course, that is where the voters are, right? Now, if the lights will go out in a few weeks' time, then politicians will start paying attention. But I hope by now that I've convinced you that these things take time, right? <clears throat> um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, price gouging, that this is a monopolistic market, and these companies are making a lot of money from us. Uh, this is the breakdown in, uh, of a dual fuel bill, uh, and this is where the supply margin is, right? It does not suggest that they're making excessive profits. Uh, the return to investment uh, of these companies is 4 to 5 percent, which is not excessively high. Uh, most people would say uh, it is pretty low. And this is exactly what you would expect, right? So there's actually six major electricity suppliers. If you believe the work of Jean Tirol, right, uh, this year's Nobel laureate, uh, then you would say that an oligopoly with six players is almost like a perfect market with an infinite amount of uh, players, right? And of course, there's easy entry. There's all sorts of sm small companies trying to break into this market. Um, <clears throat> not to say that the retail market and electricity, so that there's no sign of monopolistic behavior whatsoever, regardless of what you read in the newspapers. It's probably not there. Politicians, of course, have to respond to what voters say, so we will have a full-scale investigation uh, into monopolistic behavior. And what they will find in three years or so is that there's no such thing. Uh, that is a prediction you can take home. Um, it's not to say that the retail market is not perfect. Uh, <clears throat> and the main reason that the retail market is not perfect is because clients don't want to switch suppliers so again, electricity is not like peanut butter, that you finish your jar of peanut butter, you go to whatever supermarket takes your fancy, and then you look at the 10 different uh, types of peanut butter on offer, and you pick the one you at that moment like best. Electricity is not like that. You get into a contract for a year, typically, with an electricity supplier, and then after that year, that contract is automatically renewed, and there is no bother for you. Whereas if you want to switch supplier, there is bother for you. You have to make an effort. Uh, particularly lower educated people, less educated people, particularly elderly people, don't like the bother and uh, all the hassle of switching suppliers. So electricity consumers are pretty sticky. They just stick with the company that they've always been with. Um, <clears throat> Companies know this, and for a while they try to lure new customers by offering them sweet deals. And then the previous government said, no, 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 that's price discrimination. You're treating your new customers differently than your old customers. You have to give everybody that sweet deal. And of course, companies responded by giving everybody the more expensive tariff rather than everybody the, more, the cheaper tariff, right? So the previous governments stance that you can't have price discrimination on the retail side of electricity meant that prices uh, went up. Also meant that there's less reason to switch and actually entranced uh, a lack of competition in the retail market. Right? Uh, exactly the opposite of what they had hoped for. <clears throat> the um, current government has ordained that uh, one of the reasons why people don't switch is it's because also complicated, right? I mean, Companies offer 20 or 30 or 40 different types of contracts. That is just confusing people. It's breaking their head. It's giving them headaches. Let's just simplify and say we're going to give everybody four contracts only. <clears throat> or there's four tariffs only. It immediately means that consumer choice falls. Government has also said that everybody should be offered the lowest, the cheapest tariff of all those 40 that it used to be there, and now there's only four. Where it sort of plays a nice populist uh, measure, and you get applause in the media if you say things like that, and your name is David Cameron. Um, but 
companies aren't stupid, right? If the rule is that everybody should be offered the cheapest tariff, then what do you do as a supplier? You take the cheapest tariffs off the market, right? And you put everybody on the average tariff. Um, so in both cases, this actually, despite the rhetoric, actually increased prices. Uh, I need a few more minutes. <clears throat> Miliband again announced that if he gets elected, which by now is a big if, uh, retail prices will be frozen at the day of the election, which of course means that a smart supplier makes sure that the price is high at the day of the election. I think the chances of the Labour Party are rapidly uh, falling, uh, so this effect is smaller than it was a, a few months ago, but it's still increasing, uh, uh, it's still pushing up uh, electricity prices. So again, an intervention by an unsophisticated politician messing up a market that he doesn't really understand and uh, establishing the opposite effect. Uh, of what he wanted to achieve. <coughs> so how do we get out of this? Who is the guy on the left hand side? Who is the guy on the right hand side? This is exactly my point. The two are in law equal. Mark Carney is the regulator of our money. He heads up the uh, Bank of England. Uh, the guy on the right is Dermot Nolan, who runs our electricity system. Mark Carney is a household name. He's a very well-respected banker before he came here. Uh, he can stand up to politicians. He can go directly to the public and say, look, what these guys are planning is a load of uh, shit. We're going to do it differently. Dermot Nolan does not have those powers. Uh, <clears throat> so, like with monetary policy, energy policy is one of those things where politicians should worry about the broad parameters, <coughs> which for electricity and energy are that it should be a reliable supply, that it should be affordable, and that it should be clean. They should set those parameters. What do we mean by those things? What are our environmental goals? What are our price goals? What are uh, 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 our uh, tolerances of failure? But then the details should be left to people who actually know how this market works. Just the same reason why we made the Bank of England independent, because we were completely fed up with politicians messing about with our monetary policy. <clears throat> right? That has not happened, and as a result, we are in this uh, mess. And really, the first step to sort of making sure that this doesn't happen again in the 2020s and the 2030s is that we should have a strong and independent regulator. For the short run, for this winter, for next winter, and a few winters after that, I think we should count that we will have brownouts that there will be a shortage of electricity. That's all I wanted to say. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>